This is the story of the little American nun who our Lord Jesus called my little white dove, Sister Mary Ephraim. Included in this video will be the heavenly mission of Our Lady of America, the 12 ways Our Lady allegedly appeared to Sister, and a brief history and significance of the site where Our Lady of America first appeared. At the end of the video are links for more information. Our Lord Jesus spoke to Sister Mary Ephraim, disposing her as the Chosen One of the apparitions of Our Lady of America. Our Lady of America promised greater miracles than granted at Lourdes and Fatima. Sister Mary Ephraim, baptized as Mildred Marie Nuzel, was born on August 2, 1916, Feast of Our Lady of the Angels. That same year, in 1916, a most beautiful chapel and convent were built at the Knipe Springs Sanitarium in Rome City, Indiana, the apparition site of Our Lady of America. Sister Mary Ephraim was born of John and Anna Nuzel in Brooklyn, New York, and baptized at Most Holy Trinity Catholic Church. Soon after the family moved to Cleveland, Ohio, she was confirmed in the Sacrament of Confirmation on December 9th, the anniversary of the first apparition of Our Lady of Guadalupe and Feast of St. Juan Diego. At the age of 14, Mildred entered the active religious community of the Sisters of the Precious Blood. She entered the convent on September 12th, Feast of the Most Holy Name of Mary. She made first vows, receiving the name Sister Mary Ephraim, which means doubly fruitful. She carried out duties in domestic work and as a kindergarten teacher. In 1937, Sister was sent by the Sisters of the Precious Blood Order to the Chancery in Cincinnati. It was there that God gave her a holy priest to guide her, Reverend Paul Francis Liebold, who later became Archbishop. According to a 1954 letter written by Sister Mary Ephraim to Archbishop Liebold, our Lord Jesus said to Sister, I ask of him, Reverend Labelled, what I continue to ask of you, O Bride of my heart, prayer and penance. As a priest after my own heart, I will be with him in all his trials and sorrows. Tell him not to become discouraged at the crosses awaiting him, for I, the great high priest, go before him carrying the heaviest part of his cross. I seek always the humble and lowly of heart and since I have found two such, so I have entrusted to them a great mission. But become not vain, for I have chosen him and you only because of your unworthiness and lack of virtue. Let this thought be with you always, that you may remember that it is I working through you, who sanctify you for his glory and the salvation of souls. You are poor instruments in my hands, but through you a great work will be accomplished. I am the great sculptor of souls. With hammer and chisel I form them, that they may glorify my Father by their beauty and perfection. Be pliant in my hands, O oh my two lowly ones, my priest and my little white dove, and then will you be formed into my likeness, and through you I will be formed in souls. The personality of Sister Mary Ephraim is well confirmed in this letter to her confessor, Father Liebold, two years before the condescension of the Mother of God in Rome City. My whole longing was to live a life of complete adoration in union with Christ. That which seems to take on the appearances of petition 
is simply a desire to put on Christ, that my life of adoration may be the more perfect and thus give greater glory to the Most Holy Trinity. Paul Francis Liebold was born in 1914 and was an altar server at Holy Trinity Parish in Dayton, Ohio. He was ordained to the priesthood in 1940. He was pastor of St. Louis Parish and worked in the Archdiocese Chancery. He was a faithful, humble, and tireless servant of God. Reverend Liebold was appointed Auxiliary Bishop of Cincinnati in 1958, Bishop of Evansville in 1966 and installed as Archbishop of Cincinnati in 1969. He maintained a necessary and heartfelt relationship with Sister Mary Ephraim up to his unexpected death in 1972. He directed Sister Mary Ephraim for 32 years, supported her wishes to be a cloistered nun, and he believed in the apparitions of Our Lady. Behind every great saint is a great confessor. Such was the case of Sister Mary Ephraim and Archbishop Paul Liebold. She was in complete obedience to him as a confessor. In his own letter to Sister Mary Ephraim, the Archbishop wrote, Doing the will of God is the key to sanctity. Be ye perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. A command of Christ to be perfect. An object is perfect in so far as it measures up to the ideal of its maker and, pe and performs the job for which it was made. We are made to the image and likeness of God for God's glory and our eternal sanctification. This is the will of God, your sanctification. It is God's will that we become saints. We become saints by doing the will of God. Doing God's will is loving Him, for love seeks union with its object. Our union with God cannot be in body or, nor emotion. He is pure spirit. It is in that in which we are His image, mind and heart, intellect and will. Therefore, our object is to love God, which is accomplished by doing His will. To reach this objective, we must seek to know God's will, accept God's will, conform to God's will, love Him. As for Sister Mary Ephraim, in another private letter to her confessor, Archbishop Liebold, she revealed another encounter with our Lord Jesus. Jesus said, Bride of my heart, do you still wish to suffer all things to give me to souls? I answered, Yes, yes, dear Lord, I am poor and wretched and unworthy, but you know what is in my heart. Then he said, My little white dove, will you then continue to wear the crown of thorns and permit yourself to be nailed to the cross? I told him in the best way I could how much I desired him to do with me, just as he desired. So in this way are my desires wholly united to his. This took place one month before the apparition of Our Lady of America. Not too long before the appearances of Our Lady, the Angel of Peace, St. Michael the Archangel, appeared to Sister Mary Ephraim. The Archangel said, Receive the palm of victory. I became suspicious. I couldn't think of any victory that I had ever had that deserved such a reward. You do not believe me. Will you accept the cross? For me, this was more familiar ground. I said yes, I would accept the cross. To which he replied, Then you will accept the palm and the sword. With the sword, the saints con conquered themselves, the world and the devil. I am the angel of peace. I come to those whose hearts are attuned to the voice of God. To such as these I remain per a perpetual light through blinding darkness. I am sent by him who said, I am the light of the world. He called me little maid and little Joan. He told me that the big maid, the big Joan, 
that is St. Joan of Arc, as he had as he called her, had a great battle to fight. But though it was very great, that which I must fight is yet greater, as it is mainly against the powers of evil, and besides the forces against all good are much greater now than they were then. Little white dove of Jesus, I have been sent by him to defend you from the powers of evil. On November 20th, 1955, Sister received another visitation. I am the angel Gabriel. I have come to tell you that our Lord is pleased with your effort to do good. He asks that you go to his mother and learn great purity of heart. It was on the eve of the Feast of the North American Martyrs, September 25th, 1956, that Our Lady first appeared to Sister Mary Ephraim. Sister wrote, In the fall of 1956, I, Sister Mary Ephraim, was sent to help out at the Knipe Springs, Rome City, Indiana. It was at this place that the official visits of Our Lady began and the special mission revealed. This is the account as it was written at that time. On the Feast of the North American Martyrs, I was making the holy hour from seven to eight o'clock. I was conscious of the distinct and special feeling of the presence of Our Lady. She stood by my side and spoke to me. I felt rather than saw her, though I did see a part of her gown, which was white and a small portion of her blue sash. I was under the impression that she came as Our Lady of Lords and she herself confirmed this. Our Lady promised that greater miracles than those granted in Lourdes and Fatima would be granted here in America, the United States in particular, if we do as she desires. These are her words she spoke to me at this time. I am pleased, my child, with the love and honor my children in America give to me, especially through my glorious and unique privilege of the Immaculate Conception. I promise to reward their love by working through the power of my son's heart and my Immaculate Heart, miracles of grace among men. I do not promise miracles of the body, but of the soul. Our Lady emphasized this very much. She is anxiously concerned about our inner life. She continued, For it is mainly through these miracles of grace that the Holy Trinity is glorified among men and nations. Let America continue and grow in its love for me, and I, in return, in union with the heart of my Son, promise to work miracle wonders in her. My child, I desire that this be known. Sister continues, It was the morning of September 26th of the same year, Feast of the American Martyrs. Mass had just been concluded, and Thanksgiving over, that is, in the community form. There were a few minutes left when suddenly Our Lady appeared before me, enveloped in a soft glow of light. I knew with unspeakable certainty that it was she, though she did not speak immediately. What I noticed was the smile on Our Lady's beautiful countenance and the lily she held in her right hand. She wore a white veil, which reached almost to the waist, also a mantle and robe, which were of a pure white, not one single decoration of any kind. She wore a high and brilliant crown of gold. Her hair seemed of medium brown, also her eyes. Her feet were bare. I did not always see them as Our Lady stood on clouds that moved and so sometimes covered her blessed feet. She continued to smile. Then I saw her heart appear encircled with red roses, the symbol of suffering as it was revealed to me and sending forth flames of fire. 
With her left hand, Our Lady seemed to be holding up slightly the upper part of the mantle, so that her immaculate heart could be seen. Then, solemnly and distinctly, in calm yet majestic tones, I heard these words. I am Our Lady of America. I desire that my children honor me, especially by the purity of their lives. Sister continued, She was so beautiful and her smile held me. Our Lady seemed anxious to impress me with the truth and importance of her appearance. During the last half of the holy hour, four to five in the afternoon, the Immaculate Virgin spoke to me at length in these words. My child, I entrust you with the message that you must make known to my children in America. I wish it to be the country dedicated to my purity. The wonders I will work will be the wonders of the soul. They must have faith and believe firmly in my love for them. I desire that they be the children of my pure heart. I desire through my children of America to further the cause of faith and purity among peoples and nations. Let them come to me with confidence and simplicity, and I, their mother, will teach them to become pure like to my heart, that their own hearts may be more pleasing to the heart of my son. Behold, O my children, the tears of your mother. Shall I weep in vain? Assuage the sorrow of my heart over the ingratitude of sinful men by the love and chasteness of your lives. Will you do this for me, beloved children, or will you allow your mother to weep in vain? I come to you, O children of America, as a last resort. I plead with you to listen to my voice. Cleanse your souls in the precious blood of my Son. Live in his heart, and take me in, that I may teach you to live in great purity of heart, which is so pleasing to God. Be my army of chaste soldiers, ready to fight to the death, to preserve the purity of your souls. I am the Immaculate One, patroness of your land. Be my faithful children, as I have been your faithful mother. These are my words, O my daughter. Make them known to my children. I desire to make the whole of America my shrine by making every heart accessible to the love of my son. Our Lady confirms her identity to Sister Mary Ephraim as that which the U.S. bishops declared in 1846 by proclaiming Our Lady the Immaculate Conception, patroness of the United States of America. This title was ratified the following year in 1847 by the Holy See. Our Lady chose this little soul and this special place to begin what may be known as one of the most important apparitions, not only for the United States, but for the Church and the world. As written in Ephesians 6.12, for our wrestling is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the world of this darkness, against the spirits of wickedness in high places. Our Lord Jesus spoke to Sister, Let my love surrounding you and filling you draw souls to me in great multitudes. Such is my will, O oh my beloved one. Open then your heart, that I may pour into it without ceasing the sweet waters of my undying and saving charity. For it is from this fountain of life, which springs forth from my divine heart, that men will receive eternal life. It was to obtain this for them that I lived, suffered, and died. Our Lord speaks of pouring into hearts without ceasing the sweet waters of his undying and saving charity, the fountain of life which springs forth from his divine heart. 
This is a reference our Lord is making to the natural springs on the property where Our Lady of America appeared. Our Lord and Our Lady often make use of the natural for the supernatural. The natural springs on the property in Rome City have a long history of being used for physical health, dating back as early as the Native American inhabitants who were said to have used them for healing and rejuvenation. In 1894, a local Catholic priest by the name of Reverend Dominic Dumig met Dr. W. G. Gierman, a young physician who had been trained in Vienna, Austria by Monsignor Sebastian Knipe, using water cures for medicinal purposes. Monsignor Knipe's methods were so fruitful that Pope Leo XIII conferred upon him the office of secret chamberlain. Dr. Gierman purchased the land and developed the Rhone City Sanitarium, which opened the following year, using the Nipe Water Cure Method of Physical Healing. After some struggling in 1901, Father Dumig assisted in the purchase of the Rome City Sanitarium by the Sisters of the Precious Blood. Mother Mary Emma Nunless, Superior General of the Sisters of the Precious Blood in Ohio, was a patient in 1901, and upon her return to Ohio, she and her council obtained permission from Archbishop William Elder to purchase the land and facility. By 1902, the sisters began to make substantial improvements. Father Dumig himself became a patient of the sanitarium, then died at the facility in 1905. To accommodate the spiritual needs of the sisters, staff, patients, and visitors, a chapel was constructed in 1916, the year Sister Mary Ephraim was born. The chapel was named Our Lady, Mother of Mercy. Between 1901 and 1951, the sanitarium administered NIPE treatments to a yearly average of 2,000 guests. With declining interest in the facility, the sisters closed the sanitarium and sold the property in 1976. While Sister Mary Ephraim remained at the Nipe Spring Sanitarium for only a short while, helping in the kitchen and teaching at a nearby school, she made it very clear in her letters to Archbishop Liebold, as well as to her superior, Sister Charmaine Grilliot, Superior General, that at this place did Our Lady of America appear. Our Lady chose and blessed this place for her children to come and find healing through her church. The order reassigned Sister to various convents throughout the United States, yet it was the longing of her of Sister's heart to enter and remain in a cloistered convent. With the help of Archbishop Liebold, this was accomplished. The Sisters of Precious Blood opened a cloister in New Regal, Ohio, in which Sister Mary Ephraim joyfully lived. According to the letters of Sister Mary Ephraim to her confessor, Archbishop Liebold, between 1956 and 1958, Our Lady appeared twelve different ways and in different places. This is not to say she appeared twelve times but twelve different ways, most of whom the Church already invokes. The following are the twelve ways with depictions of Our Lady and a brief description from Sister's letters to Archbishop Liebold. Sister says, It seems that the dear Mother of God had quite a big task on her mind. She has been revealing it to me bit by bit. As it is, the very scope of it and its tremendous importance tends to frighten me in such a way that I've been tempted more than once to tear everything up, destroy every bit of writing. I've tried to convince myself that the whole thing is an illusion, the effects of my imagination and emotions. Yet, Father, it is very strange. Whenever I am about to tear up, destroy what has been written, something deep inside of me tells me I may not, I must not. 
something or maybe it is someone, prevents it every time. Because of all this I have suffered intensely, and yet never have I had such peace, never have I felt Our Lady so close to me, and never have I loved her so much as I do now. The First Apparition of Our Lady, Our Lady of Lourdes. She appeared September 25, 1956, on the eve of the Feast of the North American Martyrs. Our Lady said, I am pleased, my child, with the love and honor my children in America give to me, especially through my glorious and unique privilege of the Immaculate Conception. I promise to reward their love by working through the power of my son's heart and my immaculate heart, miracles of grace among men. I do not promise miracles of the body, but of the soul. Our Lady of America, the Immaculate Virgin, appeared September 26 and 27, 1956, as well as October 13, 1956, August 22, 1957, and more. Our Lady says, My child, I entrust you with the message that you must make known to my children in America. I wish it to be the country dedicated to my purity. The wonders I will work will be the wonders of the soul. They must have faith and believe firmly in my love for them. I desire that they be the children of my pure heart. I desire through my children of America to further the cause of faith and purity among peoples and nations. I come to you, O children of America, as a last resort. I plead with you to listen to my voice. Cleanse your souls in the precious blood of my Son. Live in his heart, and take me in that I may teach you to live in great purity of heart, which is so pleasing to God. Be my army of chaste soldiers, ready to fight to the death to preserve the purity of your souls. I am the Immaculate One, patroness of your land. Be my faithful children, as I have been your faithful mother. Our Lady of the Precious Blood On another day, she appeared as Our Lady of Precious Blood in a red cope-like cloak as recorded in a letter of sisters to Reverend Liebold. The Rome City Sanitarium was purchased by the Sisters of the Precious Blood, the order of which Sister Mary Ephraim belonged. Our Lady of Perpetual Help From a letter written March of 1957, when Sister was at the Chancery in Ohio, she saw Our Lady and she asked, Who are you? Our Lady replied, I am Our Lady of Perpetual Help. I will help you always. After that, I never failed to employ her, implore her aid under this title, reminding her of the promise she had made to help me always. And Our Lady, you know, Father, wants to help all her children. She is most anxious to do so, but she will not force this help upon us. We must longingly ask for it and freely accept it. Our Lady of Grace. In a letter dated April 25, 1957, Sister wrote, I saw her in the likeness in which she is pictured at times as Our Lady of Grace, only she wore a crown and in her right hand she held out a rosary, in her left a scapular. From these, the rosary and scapular, there came forth, as it were, darts of light, like streaks of lightning. I was then given to understand interiorly that this represented the graces that souls received through the devout use of these holy instruments of Mary. Our Lady, Mother of Sorrows I am indeed the Mother of Sorrows, and it is my children who pierce my heart. Their lives are filled with vanity and selfishness. They love my Son with their lips, but not in their hearts. They refuse to follow me and my son along the way of the cross because they have no love. 
Love gives, love does not count the cost. O oh, my children, give me your hearts, emptied of all self-seeking and sinful pleasures, and I will fill it with divine love. I will give you Jesus to hold in your hearts. He will fill it, and then Jesus will live in you and work through you for the glory of his Father. O oh, my children, turn your mother's sorrow into joy. Take the sword out of my wounded heart by doing what I ask. I seek only the glory of my Son and your greater good. Listen to your mother's voice and be the consolation of my Immaculate Heart. Our Lady of Mount Carmel Shortly after this, I saw her as Our Lady of Mount Carmel. She was holding the Divine Child, and both he and his mother were wearing a crown. She was aiding the souls in purgatory, especially those who had been faithful in the wearing of her scapular. Our Lady presented me with the lily she was holding and said to me, Take it and cherish it. It is the sign with which I mark my children. Our Lady, Mother of Mercy, Sister wrote on the second Sunday after Easter, May 5, 1957. In the year 2000, Pope St. John Paul II declared the second Sunday after Easter to be Divine Mercy Sunday. Our Lady showed herself to me today and said, I am the Mother of Mercy. Under my mantle, I will hide my children. The justice of God will not reach them if they seek refuge neath the protection of my mercy. My Son gives to me all those souls who come to me with confidence, calling upon my aid. Their salvation is in my hands. I will obtain for them the necessary graces to save their souls. Come to me, poor, suffering, and frightened ones. I am your mother. I will not forsake you. Only come to me with a wholehearted and loving trust. Place your souls into my keeping. I am that faithful mother who never forsakes her children. Honor me by your confidence and love. This I desire and ask of you, my poor children. Do not deny the wishes of your mother. Our Lady, the Queen of Heaven, appeared on her feast day of the Queenship of Mary, May 31, 1957, and said, I am the Queen of Heaven. These jewels are the graces with which I adorn my subjects. My Son wills that all grace should come through me as through a living channel. Come to me, loyal subjects, loving children that I may clothe you with the graces which will enable you to appear more fittingly before my King's Son. Come and receive the gems of eternal life. My sweet child, I am indeed a queen. I can obtain all things for my subjects, as my intercession is all-powerful with God. If only they had more confidence in my power and in the great desire I have to help them. Our Lady of the Divine Indwelling appeared to Sister on November 22nd and again on the 23rd, 1957. This apparition and the message of the Divine Indwelling so moved Sister that this became center to her spirituality and those of the Sisters in the Cloistered Convent of the Sisters of the Precious Blood, and was supported by her confessor, Archbishop Liebold. She writes, our Lady appeared standing on a globe, her right foot resting on a crescent moon, the left on the snout of a small fire-breathing dragon. She was dressed all in white, and her hair could be seen through her transparent veil, which was long enough to half envelop the globe. The veil was held about her head by a wreath of white roses, and a white rose rested on each foot. On her breast, the triangle and the eye, the symbol of the divine indwelling, could be visibly seen. A strong beam of light shone from the divine presence within Our Lady 
onto the globe at her feet. Then, halfway around the figure of Our Lady, above her head, appeared a scroll on which were written in letters of gold the words, All the glory of the king's daughter is within. Though it did not appear that her lips moved, I heard these words quite plainly. I am Our Lady of the Divine Indwelling, handmaid of Him who dwells within. Our Lady, the Immaculate Conception, Sister wrote, I had another of those experiences of which you have already heard, Father, many times, though I had not at that time been thinking of her. She suddenly appeared at my side. This person was none other than Saint Bernadette. She did not come as a sister, but as the little peasant girl who saw the Lady. I was transported somehow with her to the Lord's Grotto in France. We stood a short distance away from it, looking up into the niche, which was filled with light. In the midst of this brilliant light, I saw the Lady, the Immaculate Conception, so beautiful, so glowing, as it were, in light, that I could scarcely see the outline of her figure. It was brighter than any light I have ever seen. It was a light all heavenly and full of glory. I was transfixed. Then suddenly the figure of Our Lady seemed to dissolve in the light, but the brilliant light itself remained. Our Lady of the Holy Family, as written by Sister Mary Ephraim on March 30, 1958. As Saint Joseph promised, Jesus and Mary also came Jesus had the appearance of a boy of about 15 or 16 years old. It was about the sanctification of the family and some other matters. The canonical status and history of the Our Lady of America devotion started with Archbishop Paul F. Liebold of the Archdiocese of Cincinnati, Ohio, Sister Mary Ephraim's confessor of 32 years. He was the first bishop to recognize the private devotion to Our Lady of America in the early 1960s. He gave his imprimatur to prayers, had the medal struck, and facilitated the distribution of Sister Mary Ephraim's diary. His Excellency Raymond Burke blessed this statue of Our Lady of America, the Immaculate Virgin, patroness of our land, on November 15, 2006, on display at the USCCB conference in Baltimore. In May of 2020, the six Roman Catholic bishops with jurisdiction over this devotion as the alleged apparitions occurred in their diocese released a joint decree discussing the supernaturality of what Sister Mary Ephraim experienced as the basis for this devotion. This group of bishops was led by Bishop Kevin Rhodes of the Fort Wayne South Bend, Indiana Diocese. At this time, a decision has been reached expressing an insufficiency of facts and elements of proof to either affirm or negate the supernatural character of the presumed private revelation. The possibility remains that the apparitions may be supernatural. The faithful may practice the private devotion. The bishops have also placed Sister Mary Ephraim and the Rome City site in a favorable light. These are extremely positive findings and provide a solid foundation for moving forward in faith. Before this decree, there was only one bishop, Archbishop Paul Liebold of Happy Memory, that had approved the private devotion. Today, there are seven. This includes all the current ordinaries of the places where apparitions allegedly occurred. They have cleared the way for God's mercy and love to rise through the instrument of this devotion, of Sister Mary Ephraim, and of the chapel at Rome City.
Our Lady appeared 12 ways, and we know that the number 12 has great biblical significance. The 12 ways connects with Revelation 21, as written by the Apostle John, and signifies the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 apostles, the 12 gates of the New Jerusalem, and the 12 stars about Our Lady's crown. These 12 ways that Our Lady appeared to Sister Mary Ephraim represent all of Our Lady's apparitions over the last 20 centuries. Our Lady is reminding her little children of all her heavenly requests. She is calling her little ones to a new life as well as new blessings on her so many faithful and devoted ones. She is uniting all in prayer for her intentions, for the Church, and for the salvation of souls. Now, as Our Lady of America has said, this is her last resort. From Revelation 21, And it had a wall, great and high, having twelve gates, and in the gates twelve angels, and names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them the twelve names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Our Lady's triumph is the likeness of her children to her divine Son. Nearly 65 years ago, to this little American nun, Our Lady was preparing her children to receive the divine indwelling. The spirituality of the divine indwelling became the practice of Sister Mary Ephraim and the Sisters of the Precious Blood Cloister. Sister Mary Ephraim wrote on August 5, 1957, Our Lady spoke to me about the divine indwelling it was her life, and she lived it perfectly, always conscious of His presence, never forgetting that all her greatness came from within, from Him who dwelt there, working, loving, and doing good through her. This is what Our Lady means when she speaks of reformation, renewal. It is this about which she is so concerned, namely sanctification from within. She seemed anxious to impress me with some idea of the greatness of this gift of God to us, namely, His divine presence within our souls through sanctifying grace. Our Lord and Our Lady have been preparing the Church and the world for souls to recognize and possess the divine indwelling. It was to these two chosen souls, Sister Mary Ephraim, and Archbishop Liebold that the messages and mission of Our Lady of America have been entrusted. The letters of Sister Mary Ephraim, the hardships she bore, especially that which is unknown at this point, should be examined to give light into the sublime teachings of the Our Lady of America devotion, as well as that of Our Lady of the Divine Indwelling. According to an additional letter of Sister Mary Ephraim to Carl J. Alter, Archbishop of Cincinnati, on April 13, 1960, Our Lady asks that a statue as Our Lady of America be solemnly carried in procession in the Shrine of the Immaculate Conception in Washington, D.C. She also asks that a statue or image be in every home. Further, in 1957, our Lady said, Tell the bishops of the United States, my loyal sons, of my desires, and how I wish them to be carried out. Through him who is head over you, make known the longings of my Immaculate Heart, to establish the reign of my Divine Son in the hearts of men, and thus save them from the scourge of heaven, both now and hereafter. In a 2007 letter written by His Eminence Cardinal Raymond Burke, then Archbishop of St. Louis, to all bishops throughout the United States, he said, A special request of Our Lady of America was that her statue be placed in the Basilica of the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception. 
there is a providential connection between Sister Mary Ephraim and the late Archbishop John Francis Knoll of the Diocese of Fort Wayne, who is celebrated as the Apostle of the National Shrine. The principal apparitions of Our Lady of America to Sister Mary Ephraim took place in the chapel of the Precious Blood Sisters Convent in Knipe Springs Sanitarium near Rome City, Indiana. Archbishop Knoll, who died in 1956, maintained a summer residence at the sanitarium within a few hundred feet of the place of the apparitions. While the National Shrine is the largest shrine in the world, at which there was not a previous apparition, the private revelation to Sister Mary Ephraim very much confirms the mission of the National Shrine. His Eminence further stated, Having reviewed the correspondence between Sister Mary Ephraim and her spiritual director of many years, Monsignor Paul F. Liebold, Vicar General of the Archdiocese of Cincinnati, who later became the Bishop of Evansville and then Archbishop of Cincinnati, it is clear that the devotion, as proposed by Sister Mary Ephraim, received his approbation. What can be concluded canonically is that the devotion was both approved by Archbishop Liebold and, what is more, was actively promoted by him. In addition, over the years, other bishops have approved the devotion and have participated in public devotion to the Mother of God under the title of Our Lady of America. Additional apparitions to Sister Mary Ephraim included St. Joseph, Mother Brunner, the foundress of the Order of the Sisters of Precious Blood, St. Michael and St. Gabriel, Archangels, and more. In one encounter with St. Joseph, he said, I am the protector of the church and the home. Let my children honor my most pure heart in a special manner on the first Wednesday of the month by reciting the joyful mysteries of the rosary in memory of my life with Jesus and Mary and the love I bore them, the sorrows I suffered with them. Let them receive Holy Communion in union with the love with which I received the Savior for the first time and each time I held him in my arms. Those who honor me in this way will be consoled by my presence at their death, and I myself will conduct them safely into the presence of Jesus and Mary. Mother Maria Anna Brunner, foundress of the Sisters of the Precious Blood, on June 26, 1958, spoke to Sister Mary Ephraim, referring to the order of the sisters she founded. sister wrote, Mother Brunner suddenly appeared. Then I saw many sisters in black surrounding her. They smiled upon me, and oh, the happiness I saw on their faces. It filled me with great joy. I knew, too, at that moment, how greatly they loved me. Then Mother Brunner spoke to me, You are their crown. In you they will be glorified. You are my beloved daughter, my glory and my crown. It is not necessary that I be glorified on earth. It is enough that I am glorified in you, my daughter. Long have I prayed both on earth and in heaven that God would mark the community, that through me so humble an instrument he brought into being with a very special mission and grace. My desires have been realized in you, cherished daughter. Truly, you are after my own heart. These, my daughters, who dwell with me in the bosom of God, rejoice with me and give praise to the Most High for the glory that will come to the most precious blood of Jesus Christ through you, beloved and privileged daughter. The mother is honored in the daughter I place the mantle of my spirit upon you, 
spread it over the community. It must prepare itself for the abundance of graces God is about to shower upon it. On May 8, 1957, Sister was visited by the Archangel Michael, who spoke in these forceful words. Write, I am Michael, Angel Captain of the Lord God of Hosts. I come to announce the coming of the Kingdom, the Kingdom of Peace. The time is at hand. Repent, bestir yourselves, O sons of men. Repent and make ready your hearts, that the King may establish his kingdom within you. Do not delay, or the time of grace will pass, and with it the peace you seek. Behold, the Queen of angels and of men comes beforehand to make all things ready for her King's Son. My little sister, the message is a clear one. There is no doubt. Make it known. Do not hesitate. I, Michael, have spoken. Then Sister says, St. Michael comes to me one evening shortly after Our Lady's visit, holding an immense flaming torch. He held it towards me, saying, My little sister, you must carry this torch through the world. Sister Mary Ephraim's confessor, Archbishop Paul F. Liebold, passed into eternity in 1972. Two short years later, the Sisters of the Precious Blood closed the cloister convent. Sister lived out her years privately, honoring our Lord and Our Lady in prayer and suffering, longing for the fulfillment of Our Lady's requests. She practiced the divine indwelling and echoed the prayer Our Lady taught her by thy holy and immaculate conception, O Mary, deliver us from evil. Sister Mary Ephraim, Mildred Marie Neusel, and as dear ones called her Sister Millie, died on January 10, 2000, Feast of the Baptism of Our Lord and Feast of the Holy Family. Her body is buried in an unmarked tomb in a Catholic mausoleum. Sister Mary Ephraim is the voice of Our Lady of America. Through Sister, we come to know who Our Lady of America is, who Our Lady of the Divine Indwelling is. This is accomplished through Our Lady's messages, but also through the personality, writings, and sufferings of Sister Mary Ephraim. It is the heartfelt belief of many that Sister is the key to fulfilling the requests of Our Lady of America. She is the Chosen One by Our Lord and Our Lady, the Bernadette of Lourdes, the Lucy of Fatima, not to be dismissed, but honored in the Church. As Our Lady's children of the United States and throughout the world, pray through the intercession of Sister Mary Ephraim, Our Lady's plea can be heard and responded to with faith. I come to you, O children of America, as a last resort. I plead with you to listen to my voice. The National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception and the chapel at Rome City, Indiana, and other places Our Lady appeared in the Twelve Ways, will be places of pilgrimage for the United States and all the people of the world so that the miracles already begun with the springs may flourish in these times of great spiritual suffering and human tragedy our lord and our lady are calling their little children to a life of purity we long for the divine indwelling of the purity of jesus and mary within our souls allowing god to reign within so that true sanctity may be accomplished for the greatest benefit for the Church and the world. During recent years, many have gathered at the Knipe Springs Chapel in honor of Our Lady of America. The weekend of August 15, 2021 saw the largest crowd yet, with Holy Masses, 
confessions, and over 200 people in Eucharistic processions to honor Our Lady of America. Special emphasis was given to the Most Holy Divine Will, to Our Lady of the Divine Indwelling, to Saint Joseph, and to Sister Mary Ephraim, the Little White Dove. 